Well, good morning. Let me invite you to open a Bible to Deuteronomy. That's right, Deuteronomy. If you're using one of the Bibles that we provided, I believe it's pages 92 and 93. Deuteronomy chapter 18. And this morning we're going to be reading and then studying together verses 9 through 22. So here Moses writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, beginning in chapter 18, verse 9. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination, or tells fortunes, or interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or a charmer, or a medium, or a necromancer, or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For these nations which you are about to dispossess, listen to fortune tellers and to diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do this. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, Moses, from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire any more lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you, from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words, that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how may we know the word that the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. It is living. It is active. It is yours. And so we ask now that you yourself would be present among us, manifestly present among us, that you would cause your word to live and act according to your good and gracious will in us. We ask it for the glory of Christ and for the Christ-likeness of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you know me, I'm sure you pair me together with this, but uh, I love cinematic spoofs, you know, movies that are, the whole thing's just kind of one, one big joke. One in particular, I know, right? One in particular was called Robin Hood Men in Tights. Woo-hoo! Yeah. Where the hero, Robin Hood, attempts to galvanize his band of illiterate merry men with a speech of English eloquence. 
He calls out to them, good people who have traveled from villages near and far, lend me your ears. To which, being a spoof, the men literally begin to pluck their ears off and throw them at him. Uh, the irony, of course, is that in doing so, they're now deaf to his words. Right? Lending their ears, they have no more ears left on their heads with which to hear the hymn, and this plays out as through the short course of his speech, they quickly fall into a sleep that only an excitable preacher could awake. Would that it were that easy when it comes to receiving the word of God. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but your life will be largely shaped by the leading voices in your life. If life in some part is a succession of decisions, and you have so many to make, the question that we always need to be asking ourselves is, what's going to be decisive in those decisions? What will move you one way or another way? What will inform you? What will guide you? And do those things with absolute authority if not the weightiest voices in the room. Who is that for you this morning? Who is it that you trust implicitly? To whom do you lend your ears? Not to defy listening, like Robin Hood's merry men there, but to listen as if life depended upon it. Right? Is there an authority that we're to listen to above every other authority in the world? Is there a weightiest, not voices, but is there a weightiest voice in the room? And do we know whose voice that is? Are we granting God's word its supremacy in addressing us, in weighing us, in informing us, in fashioning us, shaping us? We know from the Bible, calls itself the lamp of God, the lamp unto our feet. But at a practical level, is that what the Word of God is to you and me? Is it the lamp unto our feet? We have to ask questions like that in order to awaken our ears because it's so very easy for us to fall asleep. Today we start a new series, Little Books, Big Messages, on a handful of minor prophets. And our text today, though written by Moses, who's about as major a true prophet as there ever was, is chosen to introduce us to the prophetic office in general. In these words of our text, God is teaching us that it matters, it matters, it matters, that we listen first and foremost to Him. His word is to have the priority, the preeminent place in our lives. Okay, so... Let's come to these verses, verses 9 to 14, and first to the point that godly living, godly living demands listening to God. Makes sense, right? That's the logic in these verses. Our lives intended to be lived to the glory of God are ear-shaped. They're ear-shaped. Intuitively, our hearts want to be led, and to be led, they seek out counsel. They listen and they absorb what they think is good and right and true and best. And as our Creator, God is quite aware of this. In fact, we know He's intended us to live upon His Word. Jesus was a perfect man. Remember in His temptations, what does He say to the devil? But that man is to live on every single word that comes from the mouth of God. That's God's intention with us. It's a sad reason, however, we find in our text that it exists because of this reality, this deafening reality that we call sin. That's the only reason our passage exists. A passage like this exists. The deafening reality of sin in our lives. God's redeemed a people, and this is key, He's redeemed a people for Himself. He's redeemed a people for His glory, and as He's bringing them into the promised land, He has to warn them. Why? Why does He have to warn them? about who they listen to. Well, it's because God's people are coming into a land of unredeemed Adams and unredeemed Eves, still looking by nature, by conscience, for the will of God, 
But they're just looking for it in all the wrong places. Do you see that in the text? All the wrong places. As Luke says in Acts chapter 17, they're scratching around for the guidance of a God that they don't know, and were it not for the grace of God, would never know or ever think to love. And so you see this in verses 10 to 11, how desperate people are to hear, not just naturally, but to hear supernaturally. How desperate people are to stretch beyond their creaturely limits to know. It's just that like Adam and Eve before us, they seek it out by anti-word guidance counselors. They sacrifice their children, it says in the text. They burn them in order to get divine guidance for their lives. They dabble in what we might call dark arts. They seek life among the dead, necromancers and whatnot. They pay handsomely to hear the good news. Can you please, someone in this bad news world, give me some good news. Tell me something good that's going to happen to me. And they pay handsomely to hear the gospel of scam artists. And are we so different today from these in Deuteronomy 18? We also sacrifice children to live the life we think at council best for us. We fiddle with stars and signs and predictors of time. We turn to psychedelic drugs. It's all the rage. Aaron Rodgers is promoting it on Sports Center, turning to psychedelic drugs for acuity of mind, help us to think more clearly, get us out of this reality into our own, what's underneath the surface of all of this. We get life coaching from people who are spiritually dead, and we love a good scam artist. We will pay handsomely for preachers who make a living off of scratching the itch in our ears. We may not examine animal entrails, but we will trust ourselves and go with our guts. What precious offerings of wasted hours will we bring to the altar of news outlets and conspiracy theorists and social media, and social media influencers. And if all of that fails, how ready we are to take divinity upon ourselves and just say stuff like, you know, I've got my truth, and you've got your truth, and I'm just going to live by my truth. Because I'm God. You see the result. It's given in verses 9 and then 12. People who listen receptively to ungodly messengers and their messages will become in both belief and practice, what a word, abominable to God. My point for these first few verses was almost don't be an abomination to God. Listen to Him. You are made by God to be shaped by intake. That's why God's so adamant in these first verses that you don't listen to the things that the world listens to, but that you listen to Him. You see the connection here in verse 9. He tells His people they're not to learn. They're not to learn to follow. You go to the New Testament, that's discipleship language. You're not to learn to follow, be discipled into the abominable, not just beliefs, but practices. Belief is linked to behavior of the godless people around him. How would they learn godlessness? How would God's people learn godlessness? Just as the godless have, verse 14, by lending their ears and their hearts with them to purveyors, to, per, to preachers, of so many godless notions and godless perceptions of reality. 
So I want you to hear that it is a lie that people are not learning evil by listening to evil. Particularly where we aren't listening very much or very well to the cleansing word of God. In a week, just think now, in a week, the course of a week, how much time do you think you give, sometimes it's almost impossible to avoid, but how much time do you think you give to the chatter of the world? Or let's say even the better counsel of finer people versus the pure word of the only true and living God who made you and gave His Son to redeem you from your sins. And we wonder why the people of God today are so unlike the people of God. We don't need surveys to tell us that there is little moral, ideological, or practical difference between the bride of Christ and Satan's world. How is that possible? Biblical illiteracy. That's how. People in the church today, Christians, are very much intimate with the ways of the world. And unfortunately, tragically, at the same time, ignorant of the Word of God. That's how. Harry Potter, we know. The Bible, not so much. Political plots, sports statistics, classwork, we know. The Bible, not so much. Christian studies, doing ministry, we know. The Bible, not so much. And so... The voice of our shepherd sounds strange at times instead of sweetly sovereign at all times. God's saying this because His people are meant to be distinct. We're meant to be different. We're meant to be odd for God, if you will. We're meant to be fools for Christ. That's our glory as heirs of grace. God knows. God knows. Even as we are, our ears are still prone to itch for counsel that's just a little more akin to our flesh. We kind of like the dirt. We're still prone to count the Word of God insufficient. It's not enough. We count the Word of God non-authoritative. I decide. I choose what I'm going to do, how I'm going to live my life. We count the Word of God irrelevant. It has not kept up with the times clearly. So we leave it behind. And the issue in all of that is really just a goal. If the goal, if the goal is a God-glorifying, God-exalting life, we will listen with exclusive love to the Word of God. But if not, we won't. As we should. But regardless, dear ones, we're to hear right here, verse 14, he says it very plainly, we are not free. We are not free as his people to pick and choose the leading voices in our lives. God has settled that for us. And to go against that rock is to venture upon a terrible fall. But now what if our conception of God's eternal word is too tightly, wrongly bound to a mortal man? Man, we do that a whole lot. When he dies, does the word of God die with him? When he moves along to another church, does the word of God go with him? Does the rock crumble? 
Are we left without foundation? Are we left without authority? Are we left without truth and grace for life? Because you see this man Moses, radiant faced with the glory of communion with God, at this point in the Bible, he's on his way out of the world. So that that's the pressing issue here. What about the Word of God now? We've only ever known it from Moses. <laughs> now he's going. He's leaving us. So what about the Word of God? How will it continue to be given to us? And how will we know that what's given to us is the Word of God? Simple, Moses says. I'm not the last of my kind. Revelation is still in progress. God has a line of prophets and one above all others. So as we enter verse 15 now, one thing we need to hear is that no man like Moses holds a monopoly on the Word of God. Moses will die, and yet the Word of God will go on. You see that? The Word is not bound to the life and ministry of any one person. You recall, later on in the New Testament, Paul was bound he was chained up in prison, and yet what does he say about the Word of God? He says, the Word of God is not bound. I may be bound, but the Word of God is not bound. God oversees the advance of His Word. God does. And so while we honor, while we should honor faithful heralds of the Word of God, we need to understand no man is bigger than the Word. A faithful teacher of the Word will labor above all. We so need to hear this. A faithful teacher of the Word of God will labor to keep himself under the Word of God. Okay? Under the Word of God. They will labor to know their place and to serve the people not by being exalted, not by exalting themselves over the Word, but by exalting and helping the people to exult in the thing that will outlast Him and them, and that is the Word of God. And in the same vein, a faithful church will realize this and give themselves not to any one man. They will not give themselves to his skill, his powers, his oratorical ability. They will not give themselves to that. They will give themselves to the very same word of God. All that other stuff is just awfully sandy in itself. If we're after strong foundation for life, Moses, great as he was, is but sand in comparison to the Word of God. So listen, the greatest gifts that a preacher can possess, the greatest gifts that a preacher can possess is the skill and will to leave a people as Martin Lloyd-Jones did. His successor, R.T. Kendall, said this. I can't even imagine walking into the pulpit of Martin Lloyd-Jones okay, as his successor. This is what Kendall said. He said, he left a people that loved the gospel more than a good sermon. Who loved preaching, like real preaching, more than liturgy. Who loved, here it is, God himself, more than a form of godliness. One thing you don't hear in any of that is Martin Lloyd-Jones. And that, in an Old Testament way, is what Moses is after right here. Forget about me. Keep going with the word of God and the God of the word. He tells them, verse 15, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you. It is to him that you shall listen. So again, just feel there 
feel there, God could have cut it off. They didn't have to continue. He could have cut it off right there with Moses. As we see in the next verse, he could have cut them off from the word because of their sinfulness. But God is committed to communicating his fullness to his people. I want you to hear that God is committed to the word. Just think about that. God is committed to the word. He's not like so many who would see the people suffer by depriving them of the whole counsel of God. And what's worse today is that we have the whole counsel of God. You have it sitting in your lap right now. The whole counsel of God, capstone in Christ, and we have it to offer to starving and suffering souls, and we just don't. We just don't. Because what we don't have so much of is the heart of God for His people. Or the heart of God for His own glory. But God here holds the both of them in perfect tandem. And so here we get the prophets. Okay? Prophetic line. And we'll cover through verse 19 by four big words. I know the outline in the bulletin is different than this. Sorry, things change over the course of a few days. Four big words. Mediation, transmission, application, incarnation. One more time. Mediation, transmission, application, incarnation. From verse 15 to the middle of verse 18, we see that the prophetic office is a mediating office. Moses reminds of a time at Horeb, probably Sinai, where God met and spoke with the people in a rather unmediated way, directly. There, the holy God gave his good law to a majority assembly of cow-worshiping sinners. And as he thundered the purest words... The people, proving the effect of the fall in their hearts, were shaken down and frightful for life. Now this is a notable point. The Word of God, if it reveals anything, reveals the glory of God, the glory of God, the beauty of God, who God is. The Word of God reveals the glory of God but it lands on unshielded sinners as the terror of God. Just like in the garden. So, the word of the one who is all our life and all our joy and all our beauty and all our peace was to them, Israel, at this time, nothing but a nightmarish confrontation with death. Words that were meant to guide them to salvation, they only heard as a sure, a certain condemnation. Though he had rescued them and loved them and provided for them for so very long, the sound of his word was that of an enemy army approaching. That right there is sin operative in them at its sinfulest. If you want to live, sinner, you cannot listen to the Lord God. That's sin. That's what it preaches. If you want to live, you cannot listen to God. But see in our text how God then counters that lie and that scheme of sin. He says, verse 17, they are right in what they've said. They cannot hear me like this, and live. But, but, that does not mean they cannot hear me at all and live. Or that they mustn't at all cost. As in verse 15, so in verse 18, I will mediate my word to them. I will condescend to make a way for them to know me. 
I will raise up a prophet like Moses from among them in mercy and grace. In other words, God will continue to speak to his people as he's done by Moses. He'll speak in a way more conducive to our fallen humanity. He'll speak by a flesh and blood person. He'll speak by a man with a face like us. <clears throat> now, truth be told, however, even his word mediated seems to really only cushion the fear inherent to the unconverted soul. Just kind of cushions that. They may not tremble as they did then or as they will if they don't repent and believe. But until they're born again, that kind of horrid fear still abides in them because sin still abides in them until then. And the guilt of a God-conscious soul also still abides until then. To the born again. But really, a more prominent thing that's happened by the grace of mediation is that the sinner, when fearful under the word of God, is far more prone to fight than take flight. You know the thing, if you're afraid, you do two things, you either fight or you take flight. Well, God in mediating his voice to them has just made it a little bit easier for them to fight instead of run away. It's not without reason that most of God's prophets, all the way to the cross of Jesus, were killed by the congregations to whom they preached, prophesied. And the apostles are going to find that out as well. And so many martyrs as well. But on the sweeter side of things, I'll just say this. It appears that Israel's terror of the glory of the speaking God leads in God's hands to the advent and grace of the Word incarnate, mediator, ultimate mediator. And as we head that way then, we need to see not just mediation, but here's the second big word, transmission. Of the prophets in general, God says, if you look at the middle of verse 18, He says, I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. So there you go. It's quick and easy. Transmission. When the prophet speaks in his office as such, the words the people hear are the words of the living God and nothing less than the words of the living God. So our speaking God here is very, very clear. The transmission from him to say, Obadiah, as we have Obadiah, or from him to Isaiah, as we have Isaiah, from creator to creature, from redeemer to sinner, from heaven to earth, from his mind, his heart, to their mouths, to the people's ears, produces, again, verse 18, my words, my words. So, How should we read the Bible, which is a collection of words from God transmitted down through people and put in this book? How should we read the Bible? With what gratitude and awe should we hear it read to us? When Hannah comes up here to read the call to worship and she reads from Luke 9, I mean, we should be like, this is crazy. This is the Word of God. When we come to Obadiah next week, then Jonah, Nahum, Zephaniah, Haggai, Malachi, we move into the New Testament, Galatians in the fall, then James, I think, and so on. How should we handle them? Or how should we be handled by them? How should we hear their words? How should we pray them? How should we preach them? That matters for preaching. That will change your preaching. Guys, today preach the way they preach because they don't functionally believe 
that that is the Word of God. So how should we preach them? How should we receive them? How should we use them in daily life? How should we talk about them after service, today, or over lunch, or at home for all of life? Is it not, is it not, as the gracious words of the living God affording divine life to souls that do not deserve it, but so desperately need it? And how is it again that Bibles are so often little more than museum relics, shelf decor, dust mops, dust traps, style points, and Sunday side pieces, rather than the ready communication of the triune God to you and me. Let's be a church as good old Josiah, rediscovering the ancient word for life today. Which moves us from mediation transmission to application. We can't miss verse 19. They ought to be as convicting and constraining as ever they were. He says there, whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him, of her. So if God is kindly condescended to speak to us in a mediated way, one-to-one, God-to-you, transmission, it is eternally incumbent upon us to listen for life. To listen for living. Wasn't that their cry? Oh God, we cannot listen to your fiery voice like this anymore lest we die. So God says, okay, I will now gift it to you like this so that you can hear it and live. And as such, God help us not to hear it and prove dead. God help us not to hear it and fake alive. God help us to listen to it as truth for life. Let's be clear on this. God knows how you and I have handled His Word. He knows what we've believed about it. He knows how we've approached it this morning. He knows how we've treated it, what we've done with it, whether we've rejected it or toyed with it or twisted it or sidelined it or whether we've loved it and lived by it. We need to know that what we've done with it, we've done with God never more plain than in the death of Jesus, the Word incarnate. And so what we need to know, and what he makes plain here, is that there will be a reckoning for how we've handled the Word of God. We are accountable to God for what we've done with the Word. Divine communication without soulful reformation, revelation, without application, being a hearer of the Word, without also being a doer of the Word, is a fool's deception that we ought to flee with divine propulsion. All of the revolutions of the Holy Spirit It is one thing for the lost, for the lost to act a fool. They aren't justified in it, but they don't even pretend to know the Word of God. 
many of them, and how heartbreaking it is, have never heard a single line of the Bible, really, in truth. But it is another thing now for you and I to have a Bible, to have the words of God, to sit under the word of God day in and day out and act a fool just like them. For there to be no obvious or verifiable difference between the world, what you see out there in the world, and the people who claim to be a word-centered people. Christian, you should and can be different than your worldly classmate. You should be different than your unbelieving spouse. You should be different than your unconverted child. You should be different than your irreligious neighbor. We should be distinct from our godless co-workers. Listen, we should be distinct from our nominal Christian friends who don't give two craps about the Word of God. We should be different than people who do not actively and accountably listen to the Bible. This is a prayer. So many live by the world because of the world's reckoning. I don't want to look dumb. And the same people then put off the word of God because they think there's never going to be a reckoning with God. Not true. We're going to come to it in Galatians in September. But the Apostle Paul just asked the question, who are we living to please most of all? Mediation, transmission, application, incarnation. It's the last one. In revealing the prophetic office, I want you to see that Moses prophesies of one above all else. He is telling them God's going to raise up a Nahum. Some of us might not have ever even heard of Nahum. He's in the Bible. Okay, God's going to raise up a Nahum, a Jonah, Jeremiah. But he's also telling them that each one of them points to one. All of them point to one. All these prophets down through redemptive history. They may represent the progress of revelation, God's revelation to us, but there's going to be one, and he's going to be the grand finale. One will be the climactic completion of revelation, God's word to us, and that is Jesus Christ. And the most direct way to show this is to take you to Luke 9 and the Mount of Transfiguration. Again, Hannah read it for us in the call to worship. There, with Peter and John and James, is Jesus. And suddenly, also, is Elijah and Moses. And they talk about the cross with Jesus, and then Peter, of course, loses his mind, says all kinds of crazy stuff, and then God shows up. Because he wants clarity. And this is what God says in Luke 9.35. Listen, he says, This is my son, my chosen one. Deuteronomy 18. Listen to him. That's on purpose. That's God quoting himself in Deuteronomy 18.15. Listen to him. He's the one. And Moses and Elijah fade out. Jesus is the only one left. And there you have it. 
So it's not just the prophets who identify Jesus as this prophet par excellence. It's God. The Father gets in on that action. And so does the rest of the New Testament, including significantly the risen Jesus himself. So a few samples, and then what it means. We just finished up John's Gospel. What did John teach us? He taught us that Jesus is the Word of God who came and dwelt among us. That's different. <laughs> that's, that's new. He's the Word of God in the flesh. Jesus says also in John that the Scriptures testify about me. All of them. They're about me. When Israel won't listen to him in his day, Jesus tells them, Moses is going to be your judge. Why? Because Moses spoke about me. <laughs> when, when disciples were despairing at his death, he shows up, raised from the dead, and he comes alongside them, and he reproves them for being what? Slow to believe all that the prophets and the law and the Psalms had spoken about him. He and Peter both say that the prophets spoke. You'll love this. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. Say that the prophets spoke by the Spirit of Christ. So who's speaking in Deuteronomy 18? Ultimately, Christ. They spoke by the Spirit of Christ. They said, he says that their essential message was about His saving death and resurrection. So, to Obadiah, ultimately some way, it's getting us to Jesus, crucified and risen from the dead. So also the writer of Hebrews, again, tells us that in Jesus, God has finalized all He wanted to say to us as with redemption, so also revelation with Jesus, it is finished. The prophetic witness of the Old Testament is realized and the cornerstone of the New Testament is laid down. Okay, so we could give a whole lot more than that. But what it means, what it means is that if you want to know God, you definitively can In Jesus, distinct from the others, we might call them the others, the other prophets, God Himself came into the world and addressed sinners that we might not die in our sins, but by faith in Him be saved and live, and live truly and eternally. So, as we go to the Old Testament and we come to the others, they only really want to do one thing. They all are envious of John the Baptist. They all want to be like him. They all want to be the one who gets joyfully eclipsed by Jesus. They're all doing the same thing. They're just going, there he is. That's the one. The whole Word of God has prepared us for him. Behold him. They all want to lead us to the person who reveals God to sinners in everything he says and does. If we'd live, we're to lend our ears finally to Jesus. Have you done that, friend? If you're unbelieving, have you done that? Please do that. Turn from your sins. Trust in him. He will save you. Dear ones, does the word of Christ, as Paul is later going to urge us, does the word of Christ dwell in us richly. We only know God. We only know the Word as well as we know Jesus. Godly listening demands listening to God. God has spoken by His prophets and one above all the others. And so, last thing here, godly listening will demand spiritual discernment. If I can go back to the prophets in general, God doesn't want His people to be snake-bitten. 
If I can put it like that. He doesn't want us to be happened upon unsuspectingly. He wants us to be aware that wherever his word is given, the devil will have his mimics. He does not like God's word to be unencumbered. But here's the thing I want you to note. His opposition is rarely so obvious. Especially to the heart that's untrained in the word of truth and life. You know what you need to spot a counterfeit. You need light. You need some other revelation for spotting counterfeits. So, this is so critical for churches, where the light is dim, Counterfeits are able to slip in more easily. And you can see by the penalty attached to it here that it's a grave thing to speak lies. It is a grave thing to speak for yourself. It is a grave thing to lead God's people into false hopes and false gods and idols and to do it in the name of God. If you're not discerning as a congregation, that will kill your soul. And as a deterrent, you see God at this time, He sets the death penalty upon, upon it. He sets the death penalty upon false prophesying. Now, that would clean up a lot of pulpits today. I'm not saying we should do that. Just saying it would clean up the pulpits. There is a reason, you come to the New Testament, that James, the Lord's brother, says this, not many of you should become teachers because you will be judged with greater strictness. It isn't the death penalty, but does that lessen the gravity? Does that lessen the sobriety? Does it lessen the weight of the responsibility of speaking truly by the Word of God? Trust me, our pulpits today are not suffering from gravity. They're suffering from levity. Churches are not diseased by a biblical sobriety. They're diseased with a worldly drunkenness. They're dying for unbiblical jollity, unbiblical pragmatism, unbiblical syncretism, unbiblical carelessness, preachers seeking worldly fame, worldly acclaim, and peoples, congregations, who love to have it so. I belong to that guy's church. He's amazing. Nothing about the Word of God, but he's amazing. That's the worm eating up our biblical literacy and fidelity today. If every pulpit, just in every true church in this land, lived by the spirit of this law so that men were dying to preach, I have no doubt that we would see a great awakening. Oh God, give it. How long will you suffer your word to be dishonored in pulpits, in churches, in your people, in the world. Give congregations a passion as this in verse 21. This should be the cry of your heart every day, and especially on the Lord's Day perhaps. How may we know the word of the Lord? <laughs> Give us the word of the Lord. Now, a little different for us. We have a Bible. They did not. They had prophets. We pray to have preachers. They had to bide their time, listen carefully, watch carefully, perhaps all their lives, in order to call a windbag a windbag. Someone into verse 22, they didn't need to fear, they didn't need to take seriously or listen to as life depended 
upon it. Of course, from time to time, as you read through the Old Testament, true prophets would rise up from God and they would often call out these false prophets and then they would be killed for it. But God doesn't leave them here without an evaluative filter while Revelation slowly but surely comes to a head in Jesus Christ. Is the word that you're hearing true to me? Is the word that you've heard, is it coming to pass? I am the truth that cannot fail. In other words, they needed to know the word of God they had and thereby the God of the word. You got to. It's no different today besides the fact that we have the whole counsel of God printed out by the millions. We need to know the word of God and we need to know the God of the word, we need light, more light, more light to spot counterfeits. And without becoming critics, we need to be kindly and soberly evaluative of the word of God, not prophesied, but preached. You can read the Bible and know that's the word of God, but how do you know that when it's preached? We don't want insubstantial windbags comfortable in the pulpit of this church. We want true preachers and true preaching and godly listening. Has that sermon affirmed God's authorship? Has it been true to the text of Scripture? Has it exposed our sin and rebellion? People don't do that apart from God speaking. God does that. Has it exposed our sin and rebellion? Has it given us true grace? Again, as people, we don't tend to do that. Cancel out sin, cancel out grace. But God exposes sin, exposes grace. So does His Word. Has the text been handled with spiritual sobriety, careful to speak the truth? Has it resonated in our souls with who our God is and what our God has done for us? Has it exposed false hopes and reestablished us more than ever before in the one true and living God? Has it been full of Jesus? Has it said, listen to Him? He's the Lord of life. Has it set us apart for Him? If it pleased the Holy Spirit, might someone be saved by what was heard? And might I, as a Christian, be sanctified? As Jesus said, the Word is mighty to do. Beloved, as we come to the prophets the next several weeks, is as good a time as any to recall that our lives are shaped by the leading voices in our lives. And to ask ourselves then, to whom are we lending our ears? I saw Time Magazine just put out a, a list of the world's most influential people. My first thought was, thank you, I now know who not to listen to. Just kidding. I'm sure some of them are okay. They put out this list of the world's most influential people. And I'm sure there'll be a great debate about it in the Twitter verse. Who is number one most influential person in the world? But for you and me, the debate is settled. And God has settled it. And God settled it when he said, listen to Jesus. God's list is one. God's list is one. And it's no spoof. It's no joke. Listen to Jesus. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, we thank you so much 
for your word. What a gift. Pour out your spirit upon the preaching of it now. Grant it to direct our paths, our footsteps, our hearts to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.